Hello and welcome. My name is Jennifer Gates, Field Services Director for the California Preservation Foundation. Thank you for joining this webinar on What Style Is It? The format for today's webinar will include an hour presentation followed by time for questions and answers. There is a toolbar on the right side of your screen. If you have a question at any time during the presentation, please type it in the box and I will either reply to you or hold the question until the end of the speaker for the speaker to answer. Please also at this time under the audio tab select if you are listening through the telephone or speakers. Lastly, to hide and unhide this toolbar, you can click on the orange arrow on the top of the screen. Today's presentation will be presented by Dr. Diane Kane. A La Jolla resident, Diane Kane is recently retired from City Planning and Community Investment Department at the City of San Diego, where she handled large-scale historic surveys as part of the long-range planning process. Previously, she was the Heritage Resources Coordinator for Caltrans District 7 in Los Angeles, where she handled Section 106 and CEQA review of historic properties. As mother of the Arroyo Seco Parkway National Scenic Byway in Los Angeles, she has had extensive experience with large-scale cultural landscape documentation and treatment issues. She is a professor of architectural history at the New School of Architecture in San Diego, and has taught architectural history and planning at several Southland universities, including San Diego State University, UCLA, and Cal Poly Pomona. Diane is a trustee of the California Preservation Foundation and co-chair of CPF's Education Committee. She is also a volunteer for the La Jolla Historical Society. Thank you for joining us today, Diane. Well, thank you very much, Jennifer. It's a pleasure to be here. Welcome to all of you out in webinar land. Uh, thank you for joining us today on the second half of our discussion on what style is it. I was asked whether this is the same lecture that some of you may have heard a few weeks ago, and I assure you it is not, although there are some aspects that we'll be looking at that will reinforce what we looked at a couple of weeks ago. So let's, let's take a look at what we are going to be talking about today. This is essentially a sorting process that I'm going to walk you through, which I have used over 30 years of doing field survey work to try to determine what style a building is when you actually encounter something out in the field. So this is a little outline of how I'm going to structure the presentation. And if you have any questions, you might want to be jotting them down and sending them in to Jennifer. Uh, so we can address them at the end of the discussion. The first thing we're going to do is look at some definitions. Uh, style versus design are some concepts that frequently get confused, so we'll sort those out. Buildings versus property types is another important category for sorting. And then architecture versus shelter. This is what people in my business call architecture with a capital A or high style architecture things designed by trained designers versus objects and buildings that you're going to see in the built environment that have no um, exalted pedigree. We call that vernacular. So we'll do a little discussion on the difference between those two. Then we'll take a look at sources of various styles. This is what architecture is about. What is the culturally loaded meaning behind what you're looking at in the built environment. We'll then follow up with exceptions to the rules I'm going to be giving you as you're looking at buildings in the field, which can throw you off and confuse you. And these are some of my favorite things to come across because they're great for generating discussion. So we'll consider retarded tear examples. This retarded tear is a Frenchy fan fancy French term for late examples. Uh, we'll look at buildings that, have that are done during transitional periods of architecture, which can give you a lot of mixed up messages. We'll look at remodeling of styles. What happens when a building is remodeled or adaptively reused, and how that affects the original style, and how you, you describe it in its current condition. And then finally, no style. What happens when you come across a building that is so puzzling you just can't categorize it at all? 
Finally, we'll take a look at another tool to help you sort into style groups, which is one of the techniques I'll be discussing, which is stylistic frequency, how styles move in concert with building cycles. And then we'll follow all this up with a discussion on how to write a building description. We have a, about a half an hour interactive identification exercise that we'll do at the end, which will will explain and give you as much time as you feel at all necessary to um, handle that exercise. So let's get into our content. First of all, style, which you see in the middle, is really a function of things occurring in the larger built environment and what is happening with that individual property. So for the macro scale here, we have the entire state of California. And architecture in various parts of the state will be influenced by a fairly large scale things, such as the climate where the building is built. So if you're in Southern California, you're going to get something different happening than if you're up in the mountains. Uh, that, that sort of leads us into ge geography and topography. If you are in a desert climate, it's going to be different from me, whether you're up in the redwoods where it rains a lot. So those are going to affect the style of your building. Economics. The economic cycle you are in is going to impact whether a building is really simple and, and fairly modest in scale or size versus whether it's very grandiose and has a lot of bric-a-brac on it. So the economics of a building cycle will help determine a style. And finally, culture. We have a lot of different groups in California who bring cultural traditions with them that will show up in their built product. So that will also affect on a very large scale what you can expect to see in a survey area. The micro scale is very simple. It's the building site, which is represented by this little farmland plot in a deed. That's when you have an owner, who we're going to call a client here, who is going to um, come up with a need for a building. Now, the owner can be an individual. It can be a group. It can be a corporation. It, so it can be like an Indian tribe. So they are going to have some design process, which can be done by an individual or by the group. And this is what we're going to call the designer to do something that has a specific function that will be responding in some way to the site conditions. So this is very specific, and that will also affect the way your historic resource turns out in terms of its style. So down to the micro scale, the actual style of a building is determined by a triangle of uh, um, factors that that sort of play out depending upon which factor is more prevalent. First of all, building materials. What are we working with? That can very much affect what you can and can't do in terms of stylistic expression. The materials will also tell you what your construction technique is going to be. And sometimes the construction technique and the materials themselves are what generate the style. And finally, historical precedent. This is where those cultural loaded uh, messages are put into a building that tell the viewer what the building is about. So let's, that's going to be um, a broad example of how you come up with styles. Now let's go into our sorting process. I'm going to give you a series of sorts where you're going to start. Let's pretend like we've got a deck of cards. Our first sort of that deck is to put what we're seeing into um, a category called a property type. Property types come are, are um, various uh, categories for historic resources. Uh, the one we most frequently work with are buildings, but we can also be working with structures, sites, or objects. And then collections of those things can be dumped together into something we call a district. All of these property types can share the same style if they were built within the same time period. So for example, I have several different property types here along the right corner. We have a site, uh, Cape Canaveral initially for us oldies, where the space program started. 
and then a series of objects uh, like the ship's sign, which is reflecting a space, space, space age metaphor, uh, as well as a building here in the Anaheim Convention Center, and a building come structure and the LEX theme building, which are all expressing the cultural imagery of space and fu the future. Now, property types uh, are linked with resource codes, which have been established by the State Office of Historic Preservation. And what I'm showing you here is a portion of Appendix 4 in the um, Instructions for Recording Historical Resources, which you can get online. And that is found down here in the uh, bottom uh, web link. What we're going to be talking about today is how you fill out this section of the primary record form, which is also something you will find on the OHP website. The uh, resource attributes, which is that list I just showed you in the previous slide, is here at P3B. And then you'll see resources. These are your property types that we just discussed. These property types are you're going to do up here in P3, you're going to describe what the property type is. What does it look like? Now, if you look at here what they're asking for, you're not going to see style indicated anywhere in that description. It says include design, materials, condition, alterations, size, setting, and boundaries. But you're not going to see style. So what is the difference between style and design? Essentially, you know, here's going to be our next sorting pile. Style is the cultural message of the building whereas design are the techniques that are used to present the style. So the first sort I do when I'm out in the field, first of all, we're looking at what's the property type, what's the, what kind of resource do we have, and then how is the style expressed through design. The second sort is, is it using formal design techniques or informal design techniques? So if you look on the left side of the slide here under formal architecture, what we're going to be looking at is uh, resources that are very regular in their design. So the plan and the elevation are quite often uh, symmetric. They're going to be very geometric. You're going to see a lot of hard edges and straight lines. Balance. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is try to find an axis. So this can also this can be in plan and it can also be in elevation and quite often in both. That will provide a symmetrical balance to the composition of the resource. So both sides match one another. So it's like looking in a mirror. These types of properties are normally hierarchical in their arrangement. So if you have symmetry in the overall uh, organization of the composition, you're also going to get it in the smaller parts, for example, in the windows and the door arrangement, or various uh, stylistic elements that will be added to uh, jazz the building up. Uh, these buildings are quite often hierarchical in arrangement, so they may be in a formal grouping with other properties, and they're quite often very big. Now, these are the high style buildings with a capital A, I was talking about, most, most often done by trained architects. And the styles that are associated with them are always in the classical tradition. So you can see those referenced down here in this box. These, uh, as we're going to be running through, our various phases of the classical language in Western architecture. Under informal architecture, that's pretty much everything else. These buildings are irregular in plan and elevation. So if you squint your eyes and you look at the outline of the building, it's not going to be a regular box. It's going to be lumpy and bumpy and quite animated in its outline. It will be unbalanced. And this is what's something we call picturesque. Mostly buildings who show this uh, design te tendency are domestic products. These are your residences in your neighborhoods or they're the vernacular buildings that are tougher to classify. So if you look down at the specific styles that use irregular design techniques, we're going to be finding them most prevalently in your Gothic, 
your vernacular styles, your historical revivals, and your exotic styles. Now modernism, which you see down here at the bottom of our uh, slide, uses design techniques from both traditions. However, these, the culturally loaded messages of modernism are very different. The formal and the informal architecture that we've discussed to this point are all referencing history of some aspect. Modernism said history is irrelevant. So the first aspect of a modern style building is there is no historical reference. Instead, what they're referencing are things such as technology, engineering, construction, or various processes. Um, they can be referencing the concept of progress or some abstract idea in philosophy or art or music. So uh, ahistorical versus historical. So that's going to be our next sort. Are we looking at formal architectural design? Are we looking at informal architectural design? And then are we, do, are we seeing any historical references or are we seeing no historical references? That will tell you whether you're looking at something from the classical tradition, something from the picturesque tradition, or something from the modern tradition. Now, what's going on in California and what are you going to expect to see if we are looking for historical precedent? In the 19th century, the two major cultural leaders in the world were England and France. So American architects and uh, cultural products are being strongly influenced by those two cultural leaders in Europe. Depending upon what part of the country you are in, you will see various styles uh, occur show it that, that depict what is popular in France and England at the time those areas were developed. Now since we're way over on the West Coast, it took a long time for these ideas to show up in California. So by the time uh, England has gone through the picturesque early Victorian and high Victorian phases of the Gothic Revival, um, all, most of that has just completely passed over California because we're not really in the Union until about 1850 when Victoria takes the throne. And we're not really getting good up-to-date material until the railroad shows up, which really speeds up communication. So if you're in San Francisco, you can expect to see some elements of the high Victorian Gothic showing up around the late eight, uh, 1860s, early 1870s. And then we're going to slide into the arts and crafts. And then there's going to be, there's going to be an overlap here because there is a bit of this re, uh, lag time, which is what I was mentioning earlier about retarded tear issues. Uh, we're going to be getting things quite late here in California. Uh, it's going to be later in Los Angeles because the railroad gets down there about uh, several years later. And then San Diego, down at the end of the state, the cul-de-sac, we don't start getting European trends showing up until the 1870s, uh, late 1870s and 80s. Now, France. France is going through a classical revival. We have almost no Greek revival in the state because, again, we're very late. Second Empire, we're getting some of that, again, more in Northern California than elsewhere. And then finally, they go into the Beaux-Arts uh, revival mode, which is including a lumping together of a whole bunch of classical revival modes. So we're going to be seeing some of that, but again, only in places where you're going to have trained architects showing up. If you're in some of the uh, less populated areas of the state, these are going to be tough to find and they're going to be pretty muddled. And that's what we're going to be discussing through the rest of this lecture. Okay, the classical tradition. We're getting uh, influences from Greece and Rome. This is the classical orders. This modular dimensions, symmetrical plans and elevations. And here's these concepts again of formal uh, design principles that we discussed earlier shown very well here in this Renaissance building by Palladio. You can see the cubic form, the applied pediment on all four sides of this building, the dome, the classical columns, and so forth. 
and then the modular aspect of the design. So here's one axis right down the middle of the plan, a cross axis, and then mirror image. So this is biaxially symmetric. And then if you start doing the map on this, which I assure you some people have, there is a module that is being used. So each portion of this building mathematically relates to every other portion of the building. So this is our classical tradition. And if you see buildings using these design traditions, that's the pile you're going to dump it into. Gothic architecture also started off with proportions exactly the way classical architecture does. In fact, it comes straight out of the Romanesque period, which is a classical style. However, because the buildings took so long to construct, they veered from these uh, initial designs and started to build the phases in whatever the contemporary fashion was. So over time, they became quite lumpy and um, the original design was changed. So you can see here in this facade of Chart Cathedral that the one tower is quite uh, massive and steep, and then this one is much taller and much fancier. Well, there's about 400 years separating those two dis uh, building campaigns, and the style of the building changed. If you, if you squint your eyes and you look at the outline, the building now becomes irregular when it originally wanted to be symmetric. This feeds into this concept called the picturesque, which became a major fashion statement in England in the mid-18th century. It was picked up by a lot of high-style designers. One of the most popular was John Nash, who worked directly for the Prince Regent, doing, uh, doing country cottages for the well-to-do who have these estates. Now, the first person who really started this tradition was, believe it or not, Marie Antoinette. So here's where she played milkmaid over at, in the outskirts of Versailles, uh, picked up by John Nash quite uh, about 20 years later in a couple of buildings that are showing different styles. This one from the vernacular of the English countryside with the thatched roof. And again, look at that lumpy building outline. And this one from Italy. Now, this building is actually being inspired not by actual Italian architecture, but by composed landscapes of Italian architecture, which is why this name gets called the picturesque. Uh, here's a Gaines, Thomas Gainsborough composed landscape. This is a real landscape. It's made up of bits and pieces of landscapes with a made up house that is dropped in the middle that, again, looks quite picturesque. So we are composing buildings to look interesting and artistic, not actually following a specific style. This is what really takes over in the American built environment from about 1850 on. And this, this trend is spread through pattern books, and it goes across the country and really informs a lot of our domestic architecture even today. Here's some Victorian examples of the various styles that are picturesque and follow on with this stylistic background. So uh, you can see them uh, indicated here. And you'll note that most of these, take again, squint your eyes, look at that bill outline. You can see it's quite lumpy, uh, nothing regular here. And then the porches add to the irregularity and the picturesque quality. So we've got the Gothic Revival. Uh, let's, let's go over here to the stick style. Again, you can see the irregularity in the outline, the variety in the gables, the movement in the facade here, uh, down to the Queen Anne, the turret, the witch's hat, uh, the multiplicity of gables. Again, try to find that straight axial line, and you'll find that there is irregularity in um, all scales of these buildings. Now, the ringers are these two. This is the Italianate. Again, it's coming from the classical tradition. And this building is fairly regular. So here's our axis. Uh, it's picturesque in that it's fairly lumpy. You've got this irregular outline. But the massing of the building is boxy and square. 
and the window arrangement is quite formal based around the central axis. Now this is our French style. Remember I was telling you that this is coming out of the Second Empire, a tradition in France, but it is being expressed in a picturesque fashion. So the building is asymmetrical, even though in France it would have been more symmetric. Uh, quite uh, recognizable through this mansard roof that is quite pronounced and is taking up about a quarter of that facade. Now in California, our, our third tradition, which is exceedingly strong here and probably stronger than the French or English tradition, which the rest of the country shares, is the Spanish tradition. And these ideas are coming in from Spain, but I might say that Spanish is a little bit too limiting. We really should say Mediterranean tradition because Spain, as you recall, was part of the Islamic Empire which stretched around the Mediterranean and went all the way over to Persia and India. So there are a lot of influences in the Spanish tradition that are not necessarily Spanish. We're going to be seeing a lot of Islamic aspects and a lot of Moorish aspects as well. Uh, one of the, the background buildings of this tradition is here at the Alhambra, which is showing these uh, stilted horseshoe arches which are coming from the Islamic tradition, and then something called a mirador, which is Arabic. And you can pick this up here in this building in Lima, Peru of 1715, the Palace of Torre Tegel. This was the governor's palace who was in charge of all of the silver trade in, from the New World. So he had the fanciest home in South America during his time of residency and all of the silver wealth that is the Spanish are pulling out of South America. His building is exceptionally up to date and very reflective of the building traditions in Spain of that day. However, it's also showing some West Coast influences because if you look really carefully down here, you're going to pick up some Chinese aspects coming across from Asia. So the New World architecture is going to be showing a mixture of things from around the world. Now this stuff is coming up initially from South America, making its way up through Central America and Mexico, and eventually coming into California via the mission system. So let's see how this plays out over time. Here we are in uh, Peru at Cusco, the, the, one of the ground centers of the silver trade. In 1664, we've got this very up-to-date Spanish Baroque building. As we're heading north into Mexico, Tosco, another huge silver center, you can see the Chigaresque style being prominently displayed on this very animated Baroque uh, facade. We've got fully formed twin towers and this very elaborate tile-lined dome, an enormous church. Um, by the time we get up to uh, southern uh, the southern portion of the United States here in Tucson. This is the fanciest mission church built in the United States uh, about 30 years after this building here at Tosco. And you can see it's being simplified, the scaling down. We still have this wonderful Chigaresque um, facade, but the, the, this tower never quite got done, and we're done out of, of a very simple plaster work here on the exterior. So it's being simplified. By the time we get up here into Santa Barbara, we're into a neoclassical phase. And the workmen who are being able to do this style are not as skilled as what we're seeing down in South America. These, the more elaborate and um, beefy elements of, of design are being stripped off and the building facade itself is, is losing a lot of that Baroque exuberance and plasticity. And then finally, by the time we get up in San Francisco, which is at the tail end of the chain, we're down to a little mission church. Uh, again, we still have those classical elements, but they are highly simplified and they're only showing on the front of the building. And the scale of the building has really come down uh, considerably 
We've, we're losing the domes, we're down to a flat roof and no towers. So this is how a high style building uh, transforms down into a vernacular building. So that transition between high style and low style we're seeing as we're progressing from the high style centers of design out into the California hinterlands. Now even in, in the urban architecture of the Spanish Empire, we're going to see a devolution from here a fairly well done vernacular into a fairly primitive vernacular. So here in Colombia and Medellin, uh, these buildings, this, now this is a reconstructed town center around the central square. You're seeing two-story buildings, tile roofs, a lot of color on these whitewashed um, buildings, the, the wooden overhanging balconies, and a little bit of detail here on our church. Here's what Los Angeles looked like in 1820, and the, it's just these flat-roofed adobe huts uh, in a fairly sorry rendition of a city center. And people visiting LA in 1820 didn't have a lot of nice things to say about it. It didn't look cute and quaint at all, the way this, this version of Medellin, Colombia looks. So again, the devolution down to vernacular. Now here's what California's vernacular looks like in about 1850. You're going to see a mixture of these Hispanic and American uh, uh, sources coming together. Uh, here at Casa de Bandini, we've got a Monterey-style two-story building, mixture of adobe and wood. Uh, Bodhi, uh, the um, Gordon Batten tradition coming in from uh, the west. Uh, we also have here at the William Heath Davis House down in San Diego, the first example of the uh, balloon framing style, which is coming in from Chicago. Now this building was actually built in Chicago, it was a kit building, and it was shipped around the Horn and wound up in San Diego to be constructed. And then finally, here's our mission system again with the vernacular, this time at Santa Inez. Vernacular architecture is most of what we're going to see when we're doing survey work. It's about 90 to 95 percent of the built environment. Uh, we've got a lot of this in the post-war period due to tract building development, as you can see here at Lakewood. We're also going to see it in a lot of strip mall development. This is a plan just pulled off the internet. But we can also see here how the vernacular influences high style design in the Norton House by Frank Geary. So Frank Geary, a Pritzker Prize winning architect, is looking at the built environment and it is inspiring him to create some high style stuff in Another tradition that's here in California more contemporarily, um, but more contemporary nature, which is deconstruction. Now the arts and crafts is really in high, high uh, movement when California goes through its first building cycle. And it is except it's the first real style that California starts developing in its, with its own stamp. So, the arts and crafts is one of these watershed periods that can um, confuse you and frustrate you if you're doing field work. First of all, it strongly influences a lot of revival styles because one aspect of the arts and crafts was a nostalgic look at history. Now, I've got to tell you, there's really no one arts and crafts style. It's a number of things. Some of the the sources of the arts and crafts date from the medieval period in England where they are looking at these late uh, picturesque medieval buildings, they're looking at ethnic buildings, and they're looking at the vernacular architecture of England. As this comes into the United States, architects are encouraged to look at their own vernacular building. So American architects begin looking at their tradition. Hence, in California, we're looking at that tradition from Bodhi, which is what's influencing the uh, arts and crafts in the Bay Area, and the mission system, which is what's influencing the arts and crafts in Southern California. And again, the arts and crafts was pretty much a domestic 
uh, activity that took place in suburban and rural locations. So you're not going to find a lot of these revival styles in highly urban areas. The styles associated with an arts and crafts background are the following. So we're going to now start going down into style groupings. That's your next fine sort. And you can see we're going to go with the ranch. Um, very, we get very early ranch styles from Cliff May, which really is part of the Pueblo revival. Um, I'm sorry, the, uh, these revival styles from the 20s. He's starting in the 30s and carrying those forwards. And then they, it evolves into modernism by the 1950s. Uh, and here's all of your period revivals. Now, the other branch of the arts and crafts that is influencing what we see in the 20th century uh, built environment are these ahistorical styles. These are tied to progressivism and social causes. Turn it off. Excuse me, a little bit of technical difficulties here. Okay, uh, these 20th century styles are, um, the ahistorical ones, are tied to progressivism and social causes. Um, some of these are in dealing with communal artistic activities, such as the Bauhaus, and the belief in the transformative qualities of architecture. So these are two of the primary uh, philosophies of the international style. And then the influence from nature, which is influencing Frank Lloyd Wright and all of the uh, Prairie School people. So these are the various styles that really are not coming from a historical reference perspective, but are looking at the other components of the arts and crafts to, uh, for their inspiration. OK, so now we've got some stylistic uh, groupings that we can further refine our sorts to determine what our style is of our buildings. Now, next sort is going to be exoticism. These are non-Western inspired references. This starts in England, again with the picturesque. Uh, the Indian influence coming in is from the British Empire and the English being out in India. And we've got John Nash again here with this wonderful picturesque rendition of an Indian structure built for the Prince Regent as his pleasure palace. This is where he hung out with his friends and had dinner parties. Uh, we have other stylistic references. This is the Japanese pavilion at the 1893 exhibition. And this is one of the buildings that a number of craftsmen architects saw when they went to that exposition and it very strongly influenced what uh, Green and Green, for example, in their work in Southern California. So that Japanese exoticism starts working its way into the arts and crafts. We have uh, other non-Western um, influences coming in from archaeological finds. Here in Egypt, we're going to get an Egypt revival, Egyptian revival in the 1820s. Don't have any of that stuff in California. But certainly with the discovery of King Tut's tomb in the 1920s, you're going to see some Egyptian revival stuff showing up. Uh, Mayan revival. There were discoveries down in Latin, in, uh, Latin America of uh, Mayan excavations, and that starts feeding into the built environment in the early 20s. And then Pueblo revival coming in from the Southwest in an interest in that uh, particular tradition. And then finally, the Chinese. The Chinese have been in California uh, from the, the very, very early days. And this is an authentic Chinese cultural product uh, in downtown San Francisco as the gateway to Chinatown. So these are various sources that we're going to see showing up in California. Now you have to be careful because some of these things are authentic cultural products from groups that have emigrated here, and they are just building their, in their own building tradition. So here's some examples of buildings that you will find out in the built environment that are not exotic, picturesque revival styles. These are authentic cultural products. 
However, you're also going to get uh, picturesque versions associated with the entertainment and the tourism industry here in California, which is one of the aspects of our geography and our culture that is using uh, and appropriating cultural language for other purposes. So here we have an exposition building taking advantage of the uh, Egyptian revival, as well as theaters. Here's the Egyptian up in Hollywood. Uh, Chinese cultural products here being appropriated by uh, Grauman's. And uh, the Mayan style here in a hotel up along Route 66 in Monrovia. And even inspiring Frank Lloyd Wright with his textile blockhouses. And then finally, um, the Indian and sort of, this is kind of a hybrid uh, uh, complex uh, influenced from many sources, the um, Loma Land Theos Theosophical Society here in San Diego from the uh, late 1890s. Popular culture is also playing into our built environment quite a lot. Again, we are where the automobile first really came into its prominence, and we have a lot of our built environment influenced by auto-related uh, products and uh, lifestyle. So we can see here in these various um, uh, built, these various built products that are, are sort of blown up uh, signs to attract people in their automobiles to, to buy, buy, buy. And we have the autos going at various scales. Uh, these two, uh, Randy's Donuts and Pale of the Pup, dealing with uh, people on surface streets, whereas the freeway here and arterials looking with a little bit higher speed traffic, you need things that are a little bit more simplified and a little flashier, such as the car wash from the 1950s, or uh, this is a, an old nightclub, which is at the tail end of Route 101 in um, San Diego. And then freeway scale, again, Frank Gehry uh, taking the billboard uh, mentality of these products, blowing it up to freeway scale, and having the facade of this building changing colors depending upon the speed you're going at on the freeway and the directional flow of the traffic. So popular culture is certainly playing into our built environment in a way that it doesn't show up as much in other parts of the country. Modernism. Modernism is getting a lot of its cultural products from technology and materials. These are some 19th century European buildings that are feeding very much into this engineering mentality uh, that modernism can express in some of its, its um, components. So here we have the Crystal Pavilion in London, uh, glass and metal, uh, the Eiffel Tower, Sacre Bleu, what are we doing with this, uh, this wart upon the uh, beautiful city of Paris, and then some concrete buildings showing the plasticity of the material of poured concrete. Modernism also takes a lot of its cues from abstract art. So if you're having a hard time figuring out what style something is, start thinking about paintings and sculpture and music and various uh, products from philosophy to um, name your style. Because we're making up a lot of this stuff right now as we're doing field work. We have a very robust modern component to our built environment, and a lot of this stuff has not been very well researched um, in terms of the vernacular expressions that we're seeing around California. So you're not going to find a lot of this stuff in style guidebooks. Now, to give you some examples of where these things um, are coming from, here's cubism. And certainly Frank Gehry, I'm not suggesting Frank Gehry is doing a cubist building, but he is certainly interested in the same kinds of philosophical um, ideas presented by Picasso here in his famous cubist essay in his uh, buildings where he's fragmenting surfaces and showing motion in the building. Um, it, you know, he's, asked, he's addressing the question, how do you make a building move? And same way Picasso is asking that question in Le Demoiselle d'Avignon. Now, Cesar Pelli over here at the Pacific Design Center is coming up with a very formal, sleek uh, building that is interested more in reflective light and shape and what can you do with glass. And 
this is a kind of the same sorts of things that Mark Lotko is expressing in his very um, formal uh, abstract paintings. And then this, I, I thought this was really fun. This is a building I found um, on the internet. It's not built, it's actually a model, but it's showing the same kind of interest in expressing the fourth dimension of time and speed and motion as the futurist uh, sculptures were here, uh, this Mario Batti piece from the 1920s. So a lot of these ideas are playing out in this high style architecture. Um, architects are very much looking at other sources for their ideas and you may really have to dig to see what those sources are in order to figure out what to call the style of whatever you're encountering out there in the field. Metaphor. This is another thing modernists are using. This is primarily the branch of architecture that was um, founded by Frank Lloyd Wright and a lot of his followers at Taliesin. This is coming out of the Art Nouveau period, believe it or not, and the Prairie style. So these folks are getting their inspiration from nature. Uh, you can see some of the things here on the screen that they might be looking at. It feeds into an aspect of architecture called expressionism, which is not often discussed, but we have here a design. This was a drawing for a building that was never built from the 1920s from a German expressionist. So you may have heard of expressionism in painting, but you're probably not aware that there was an expressionism movement in architecture. And a lot of what you're seeing from the Taliesin School is taking those concepts and working them into a built environment. So you can see here at Lloyd Wright's Wayfarer's Chapel in Palos Verdes, this interest in faceting that you're picking up here in this crystal uh, design taken from geological forms in nature. This building, I, I'm sorry to say it's not in California. It should be, but it's not. But it's in the shape of a leaf, and it's down in Brazil in a um, tropical area. So it's very much showing the influence of nature. And if you saw the interiors, I, I didn't have enough room here, but it looks very Wrightian in its um, manifestation. Now, what's happening in the 20th century in terms of styles and uh, what, what periods are going on and how are these styles interplaying with one another? One of the nice things about these webinars is you're going to get a link to this online and you can go back and refer to some of these charts. Now, these are things I've made up for some of my classes, which I'm very pleased to share with you, where you can see how these various styles interplay with one another and move through time. So here's a timeline from the first uh, half of the 20th century, and you can see here's the arts and crafts. It's playing out in these various revival styles, and eventually, uh, falls into the ranch by the mid by mid century, so the ranch style starts in the 1930s with Cliff May, and then he begins to simplify what he's doing, which the, his early stuff looks very period revival, and he begins to simplify it and uh, turn it into a mass product, uh, using a lot of the concepts of modernism here in his ranch designs from the uh, 1950s and on. Classicism is continuing. It is still being done today. It goes into a neoclassical revival and the colonial revival by the 1930s. And then also the WPA Modern, which is including Art Deco and Streamline Modern. So uh, these are all styles allied with this classical tradition. The Art Nouveau plays into Art Deco which we have a lot of in California, and then it just kind of dies out. And again, some of this uh, moves into the WPA Modern, but it's pretty much dead by the time you get into the, into the Depression because it's a very expensive style to produce. Modernism, here's a, we look at this primarily with painting and sculpture to begin with, but then it moves into a built form here with the Bauhaus in the 1920s in Europe. 
Playing into that are some ideas of constructivism, uh, Dada, and surrealism. Now, these are primarily painting movements until you get into uh, the 1950s and beyond, where they begin to play into abstract expressionism. And these are, are ideas that then get picked up by Frank Gehry and his crowd for deconstructionism. So you're going to see that you've got a pool of this stuff. It stops being produced, but then they go back to it and pick it up in, by the 1980s and begin to play around with it again. OK, now as we go into the late 20th century, I, a lot of our surveys are now going up through the 1970s. And most style guides don't get up that far. So as that timeline is moving, I think this chart is going to become more and more useful to you. We have uh, postmodernism, which starts in the 1960s. And again, that is picking up with all of these revival styles, going very heavily into the vernacular, postmodern classicism, and then pop art. So there's that pop element in the environment that we looked at earlier uh, being expressed through things like Disneyland and Las Vegas, uh, seeing this a lot in casino architecture, again, theaters, and um, the entertainment industry in California. And they're, again, looking at a lot of this stuff up here. And then preservation and historical revival styles come back heavily with postmodernism. Modernism is still continuing. That splits out into these three um, channels. We have the high-tech stuff, which is very much expressing ideas of engineering and materials. So this is where the deconstruction people come in. And then we have a lot of computer-aided design that is going on. You're probably not going to be picking these up in surveys, but if you have any, in your, computer, in your um, community, I would flag them as potentially historic. And if you have any um, leeway at the local level for uh, flagging these buildings, grab them, because they really are precedent setting. Uh, late modernism here feeds into this minimalist uh, component. And we have a lot of this. These are your glass-skinned uh, boxes. So those are uh, coming out of minimalism. And then expressionism, that's that Frank Lloyd Wrightian uh, component. That feeds into brutalism, your concrete, uh, poured concrete buildings, which can be either the boxy form or very curvilinear or flowy form. And then your googie stuff, all of your um, roadside uh, boomerang roof uh, pyramidal uh, structures. OK, so we've got our, our um, context for our style. The next sort is going to be sorts. So when you have a, a, a large survey area, what you're going to be doing, uh, an easy way to do this to uh, figure out what style a building is, is to do subgroups. So this is an example of a um, uh, of a graph that we put together surveying about 12,000 buildings in one of the older neighborhoods in San Diego. We came up with seven style groups. And you can see from the style groups here that most of what we were picking up was the Spanish colonial stuff and craftsman stuff. So, And then some eclectic, which was a mixture of the period revival and exotic styles. So if you lump these together, you can pretty much tell that our, the main period that our, our survey area was building out was probably the teens through the 30s. We have some Victorian things coming in. So you can see that um, a very small percentage of our, built, of our style was, was of these styles were coming in uh, pre-1900. And then we had a little bump post uh, post-war with some more contemporary stuff. So we lumped our uh, styles into groupings. And then we wound up with some stuff that had no style whatsoever. And that's, that's your catch-all. Now, exceptions. There, once you get these into groups, you're going to find that some buildings are going to manifest more than one style. And this most often happens among style groups. This particularly is 
prevalent in the, the Spanish, or I would say here, Mediterranean groups. Because remember in Spain, we had mixtures from the Moorish tradition, Islam, you're going to get some Pueblo revival stuff in there because of the influence from the Southwest, mission revival, and then Italianate stuff. So in California, we tend to mix all of this stuff together, and it's, it's not going to be uncommon that these styles will all manifest together in the same building. So we can see here in our, in our area, we had Spanish colonial revival, Spanish eclectic as the most prevalent style showing up. But that was really a catch-all for a lot of things we couldn't I, clearly identify as Pueblo revival or monterey revival, such as these examples here, which are much clearer style expressions. A good example of all these things showing up in one building is here the, the Mission Inn, which has um, Spanish uh, references from all over the map and every, histor every historical period possible. Okay, retarded tear styles. Uh, in our group, I noticed I mentioned that we had some Victorian buildings, but when we really started looking at um, at our uh, when we really started looking at these Victorian buildings, we saw a lot of Victorian elements that slid over into what you would normally call the craftsman period. So here's our building cycles. I was telling you that the styles quite often track with building cycles. So if you look at the dates on the buildings that we captured in the survey, most of the buildings were built in the 1920s. That was a huge boom period, uh, probably everywhere in California. Uh, you're getting a kick here in San Diego with the lead up to the 1915 exhibition, and then a slump in the 30s with the Depression and World War II in the 40s, and then it kicks up again here in the 50s. Now, we didn't get the 60s because our survey date cut off at 62. So you can see the building cycles here through the decades, and you would expect that your Victorian material would pretty much peter out by the end of the 19th century. But that really didn't happen in San Diego. Because again, I said, we're at the end of the state, we're in this cul-de-sac. So as we really started looking at what we were classifying as Queen Anne and Victorian vernacular, we had a lot of this stuff that got dumped into the craftsman. Um, we had a lot of like mixed styles. And when we really started looking at our craftsman buildings, we realized that we had a lot that really could also be Victorian. So we resorted and found out that our Victorian period actually went up to about 1920. So we had some very late, late, late Victorian elements showing up in San Diego when we really started looking at what we had picked up in the field. And by taking all of these, uh, tr tr I'm sorry, traditional um, styles that are Victorian and then adding in Welcome to GoToWebinar, web events made easy. Because we most often do not use trained people to design the buildings. So people are pulling things that they like together into something that expresses who they are and what they want to be saying about them. So because we are using a number of different sources uh, and client whim, we're going to be getting a lot of mixtures in buildings. So that can throw you off, too. Sorry to interrupt, Diane. Sorry yeah. to interrupt, Diane. I just wanted to let you know that it is um, one o'clock, and I know that you wanted to do that. Um, the practice um, session. We're just too. about done here. If okay, you thank let you. Let me finish up. Uh -huh. Sure. So here's some ranch buildings, and we would normally expect them to be more modernistic, but we can see those uh, period revival styles pulling forward into a ranch-style building. Okay, transitions. Now this is the toughest one. And if you can understand this, you'll get the, the gist of the methodology I've been trying to present through this, uh, through this lecture. The, ninth, the period from 1890 to 19, roughly about 1910 is the transitional period. And remember, that's the period of the arts and crafts where we have this sort going on between period revival and more modern things occurring. 
This was a great example that one of our previous listeners from Vallejo submitted, and he wanted to know what style is this building. So to go through this sort exercise, let's take a look at this. There are some aspects here that are from formal uh, design. So it's boxy and regular in the massing. We have a frontal two-story facade, which is symmetrically arranged. We have some classical elements, which you can pick up here at the portico. Uh, we have the Palladian window up here, which was later changed, a bullseye window in each of the gables. But we've got this weird pair of low-pitch roof. So we've got a high-pitch roof here and a low-pitch roof there. Hmm, that's puzzling. And then with the informal design, We've got these very steeply pitched gables, and that's coming out of your medieval tradition. We have uh, twin gables, this triple dormer window again, a second story jetty, and you can see this little flared kick out at the eaves, uh, upswept eaves here, and exposed rafter tails. So let's do our sort. We have here from the formal design various elements from the colonial revival and the shingle style. And what I've done here in purple is showing you those elements that are coinciding with both the colonial revival and the shingle style. And then from the informal design, we have elements from the Queen Anne and the arts and crafts. So the black is stuff that is shared by both the arts and crafts and the Queen Anne. The shingle siding here in the informal design, remember that's that shaggy textured stuff, is showing up over here with the shingle style. And then we have a low-pitched dormer roof, which is part of the arts and crafts. So that's an, that's an incoming style. And then we have two elements here, which I have no idea where they came from. So this building is a real hodgepodge. And about all you can do, is, it's very much a hybrid and assign some of those slash marks to it. Uh, remodeling. This is a building that started off as one style and then was changed by the owner a few years later into another style. So if you didn't realize this building had been changed, you might take a look at the hip to tile roof and these pavilions, these side pavilions, and say, aha, it's a, a Renaissance revival, where it actually started here as something that looked much more of those arts. Uh, here's another example of a remodeled building. This one again by my, one of my favorite architects, Frank Geary. It started off as a Dutch colonial revival building. You can pick it up by, this, by the roof line. And then was pretty much hacked to bits with modern materials being added around it. So the only thing you can really pick out from the street anymore is the chimney and the original roof line. And so we've got another mixed building here, Dutch colonial deconstructionist. And then finally, no style. Uh, this again is a high style architect doing a low style vernacular building. Uh, Gill is very interested in modern materials. We might call this modernism, but at the time this still building was built, which is 1908, modernism hadn't been invented yet. So let's just take a look at how we would uh, describe this. The size is two stories. It's a rectangular box where it's massing, made of reinforced concrete material with a flat roof. We have paired one over one windows, which are stacked and formally arranged in banks around a central access. So this is a very formally designed building. It's a scientific laboratory as the property type. And then the question is, what, what would you call this? Well, take your pick. It could be modern. It could be utilitarian. It could be industrial vernacular. That's the surveys, surveyor's prerogative. So that's exactly how you go about describing a property. Use the preservation brief 17 for a resource. There are a number of field guides that you can try in order to figure out the style and then use this technique. First, describe the basic shape. Discuss the arrangement of the front facade. Start from the top and work down. Start large and then work small. Describe in both two and three dimensions 
and then also discuss the surroundings. Now, some of those elements you can get from Sanborn maps and from aerial photographs, or just go to Google Earth and take a look at the footprints of the buildings to figure out the three-dimensional volumes. Take a look at the shape. Is it regular? Is it irregular? Does it follow one of these vernacular alphabet forms? Describe the roof and the roof features, various projections, the openings, the trim, any ornament, the surface materials, and the craft of construction. And here's your, your reference in the webinar to where you can find Preservation Brief 17. Finally, this is the, here's a recap of the methodology that we've been discussing. So here's your, your object that you're trying to describe. Figure out whether the design is formal, informal, or mixed which design elements are being used. Here's your formal design elements. Here's your informal. Figure out your style group. Is it classical? Is it period revival? Is it modern? What are your character defining features? Start drilling down by describing them. And then from there, figure out what your style group is and your style. Uh, here's what you're going to find. These are some really good uh, cheat sheets. I would. I really like working from the footprint or the massing of the building first. And you can find these little diagrams in a field guide to American houses. I think the most important thing is to look at the root slope. That will very much tip tip you off as to whether it's pre or post 1900. And then from there you can drill down. Uh, this help guide will then help you with the. Uh, various details to describe them. And then here is another one that I really like that deals with vernacular buildings. Again, it's got a lot of good diagrams that are all to the same scale that can help you describe those details. Okay, let's go on to uh, Jennifer. Do we have any questions? If while um, Diane is bringing up the quiz, if you guys would like to go ahead and submit your questions, I will go ahead and start compiling them for her. Um, we have about 20 more minutes um, left in today's webinar. So again, if you would like to fill out a question, you just submit it um, through the bar on the far right side. You, um, if you have hidden your toolbar, just hit the orange arrow again to unhide it. Okay, this is the audience participation part. If you have a piece of paper and a pencil, um, I, I walked you through a couple of examples of how to do property description in the earlier part of the presentation. Uh, here's another one that's really tough. This is one of those transitional buildings. I'll walk you through this one, and then we're going to do the audience participation part, and we'll give you an opportunity to address some multiple choice questions, and then we'll give you the answers, and you can see how well you did. So, Jennifer, do, do I need to close this down? No, you're fine. Okay. Okay, so under formal design, again, close your eyes, look at the exterior outline of the building. So we have something that's very boxy with the pyramidal roof. So the box is going to have a square footprint. Now, we, we can even see the side view. That's really Normally, if you're out photographing, you really want to get that three-quarters view so you can see both, the, the, both sides of the building. So what we're seeing is the footprint is square, but then we have these little bump outs with the, a side bay and a front, frontal bay. And then we, here's those um, low-pitched dormers that we saw in the transitional element a little bit earlier. And I told you that was craftsman. Here's a more... Uh, sort of blatant description of something that could be craftsman. But we're seeing some other elements here that maybe not be so craftsman-y. 
So start here. You've got a square footprint. We have a pyramidal roof, a cubed volume. Now, symmetrical dormers. We've got one over here and one over here. So we're, if you look at both sides of this roof, uh, we're starting to see some symmetry up in this area. But uh, we've got classical columns. That's, like a, that's coming from the classical uh, tradition. We have an arched doorway. So we have a little Palladian motif going here on the corner. So we know that that's classical. Uh, engaged pilasters on the front facade coming into this entablature and some, uh, some corbels that are right up here. So all of these are coming out of our classical tradition, as well as putting this up on a little raised plinth with some staircases, making it look important. So if you remember back to that Renaissance revival, or the Renaissance example I showed you of the Villa Rotunda, this is kind of a, a, a low-style example of that cubed uh, uh, temple front, on a temple on a podium. But we also have some informal design aspects. Uh, we've got this asymmetry, and then this bumpiness, that, that irregularity of the bay windows. And then the windows themselves have some uh, faceted detailing up in the transom. We've got a Chicago-style window, which we know is coming in with the Craftsman period, and um, upswept ease. So if you take a look at the roof line, it kicks out just a little bit here at the dormers. So these are all of your informal design elements. So what we have here is what I'm calling a pyramidal colonial revival, Queen Anne free classic bungalow. So you, you can get really creative with this, and some of it really only is limited by the space you've got on your form to fill this out. OK, everybody ready for the participation? OK, so here's your first uh, example. Is it formal or informal design? So let's mark that down, circle it. What style group is it? What details do you see? Do you see any corbel balustrades? Well, I don't. How about a pented parapet? Hmm. Stylized ornament, do you see any of that? Raised plinth or perhaps an ionic portico. So this is multiple choice, and there are more answers. You could, there's more than one right answer. And then here's your style choices. What do we think it is? So I'll give you folks a couple of seconds to uh, make your choices. OK, everybody ready? Here's the answer. Whoops, what happened? There we go. OK, the red is your answer. How'd you guys do? OK, example number two. Ready? OK, formal or informal design? What's your style group? Classical, Victorian, arts and crafts? OK, look at your roof pitch. That is the first, first giveaway. Look at your outline of your building for the first box. Look at your roof pitch for the second box. If it's high and steep, it's going to be pre-1900. If it's, if it's sort of medium pitch, it's going to be post-1900. Or maybe you know, 1890 to 1910. If it's flat, you're going to be into your 1930s. Look at your details. Do we see a bay window? Stucco siding? Mansard roof? Side tower? Any stylized ornament? Stylized ornament is ornament that is very flat and close to the building. So is your ornament here very three-dimensional, highly textured? Uh, is it uh, somewhat uh, flattened, or is it just flat up against the building? So we're sort of looking at the profile of the ornament. How beefy is it versus how flat? And that can also help tell you where, where you are on your timeline. And then finally, what style is it? Make your final selections. Looking for your final answer? OK, here we go. 
We have some mixed elements in here, so a little bit of both. This is um, Victorian in your style group, very definitely. You see a big bay window here. Here's your mansard roof with the side tower. That's this informal aspect. And then Second Empire is our style. OK, example number three. Formal or informal design. Swint your eyes, look at the outline. We have that stepped outline, the flat roof we were talking about. Here's our central axis. I think I'm seeing mirror image. So make your choice. Style group. It's going, we know it's going to be post-1900 because we have a flat roof. So we can rule out Victorian. We can rule out um, some of these other ones. Details. Do we see stepped massing? Do we see any art glass? Do we see a side tower? Stylized ornament? No, spindle work. OK. Make your choice. Everybody ready? Here's your answer. Formal design, certainly the modern group. We have stepped massing. And here's our stylized ornament. If you take a look at the, uh, the columns there, whoops, let's go back. Take a look at the columns, you'll see how flat they are. We have uh, almost no base and capital. And then we have a very flat ornament here. We have actually have inscribed ornament here over the windows. So very much um, showing some Art Deco motifs of the WPA Modern. And then here's some more stylized inscribed ornament. OK, formal design, informal design. style group. Well, we know it's not Victorian. So you can do this by, by process of elimination. Details, curved lines. Well, take a look there. Stepped parapet. Yes or no. One over one windows. Yes or no. Neon. Stylized ornament. Choose your style. And a number of um, possibilities here. OK, we ready for the answers. We have formal design here, symmetric. We're in the modern style group. We're, the style is being expressed with curved lines. We have neon and stylized ornament. You can't see it real well. The lobby area here, you can pick some of it up here. It's highly flat. You can certainly pick it up here with the streamlining and here in the tower. Uh, this, believe it or not, is ornament. It's uh, quite, and it's quite flat. So, so we've got some aspects in the lobby detailing of Art Deco and uh, streamlined modern. So we've got a little bit of both in this one. Number Thank you. Five. Oh, we do have one question, Diane. Sure. Um, it says, ask more if you could tell us some more about brutalism. I certainly can. I think I've got an example coming up here. Brutalism was uh, was came in around the early to mid fifties in France. Doesn't start showing up in the United States until the mid mid sixties, and I think it was highly popular up at UC Berkeley and the architecture school there. The, uh, the dean of the school was, was extremely um, enamored of it. You, so it start, sort of starts there in California and then spreads from the Bay Area down south. It is one of your contemporary uh, expressions. And I have an example of it here. Um, not exactly sure where it's coming up. But it's, it's basically blocky poured concrete. 
And once you see these things, you will absolutely never forget the style. It, it looks brutal. They're very unfriendly. OK, um, let's take a look at the example here. Little Gothic Revival Church that should have been fairly easy for you all to, to um, distinguish. OK, let's try this one. Again, look at your form. Is it symmetric or asymmetric? Uh, you see some classical elements here that should give you a hint. Are we seeing any of these issues, any of these things here? Pointed arches, bay windows. Hmm. Take a look here. Do we have a choice? How are we going to characterize this? Ready for your answer. Okay, formal design. We have a classical revival thing going on here. Definitely the pediment. This is a clear giveaway. If you just look at the property type, this is a bank. Banks are almost always in commercial style. Uh, we have some engaged pilasters here at the corner, a beautifully detailed cornice, a pediment. Look at the, uh, the detailing up here at the roof line and a dome. So again, it's another one of these renditions of the Villa Rotunda and very much Renaissance revival. OK, this is a bit of a, um, a ringer because it's a reconstructed building. Those of you in Ventura probably know what this is. But uh, take a look at the siding here. We've got a um, boxy building. So it looks like it could be fairly regular. Certainly on this facade it is. We've got a, an axis here. You've got to figure out what's the main facade, and I'm not exactly sure. Uh, it looks like we've got something that's not quite symmetric going on here. Uh, the board should tell you that this is a pre-1900 building, and certainly the date is giving us a hint. So we're going to be looking at some Victorian style. Let's take a look at our details, and um, let's give a choice here at what we're seeing. Now this, this is very interesting because these look to me like they are cast iron columns. And this is something that's very, very American coming um, with these prefab parts, expressing a classical vocabulary with modern materials. Very interesting aspect of 19th century architecture. OK, here's our answer. Uh, again, remember the Italianate style was a little more formal. Uh, we've got a, a lot of symmetry in this building with a classical colonnade all the way around it. I would say that could almost be latent Greek revival as well. Oh, here's a good one. Um, could probably, you've probably all seen stuff like this out in your survey area and scratched your head and trying to figure out what do I do with this. So we have some pent roofs, uh, boxy massing. Looks fairly formal around an axis, or at least like it wanted to be. Industrial materials. Um, no overt messages here, ahistorical. So pick your style. Again, take your pick on what you want to call this. Surveyor's choice. OK, a more contemporary building. We've got a flat roof. Got some asymmetrical massing going on. Uh, we've got um, the building jutting out over a uh, sort of a free entry area here. So we know that uh, we're going to be post-1900, probably post-1950. So you're going to be looking into your contemporary styles. Uh, you have a lot of choices over here. These are going to be waning classical uh, motifs. This will be stripped of any 
style, streamlined modern, again, sort of waning uh, in those arts is going to be dealing with some classical references. So here's our answer. Now, if you want to know what a pilo T is, I was having a hard time trying to decide if these components were pilo T's or columns. But a pilo T, again, is part of the international style to raise the building up off the ground to show its underside, to show that this is a box. And in brutalism, those pilo T's are highly, um, they're, they're highly beefed up. So they're really, really massive getting those concrete buildings up in the, in the air. They're, they're kind of unwieldy looking things. But it is a later version. The international style, the, the attempt is to make the building look very light and very airy. The brutalist uh, style is going to be expressed fairly similarly, but it's going to look very, very heavy. OK, here we go. Um, this will uh, need to be our last example. one. Mm -hmm. Last example, and I guess we didn't get to our brutalist example. So formal design, informal design. Let's look at our outline here, sort of irregular. Let's look at our materials. This is going to be pre or post 1900. Look at the roof pitch. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, texture showing up in the building, a lot of hand work. So some of our details, we're ready for the answer, the final answer. OK, if, one of you, if you're wondering what a cockpit is, it's this component up top in the second story. This is what's called an airplane bungalow. And it is a, a certain type of bungalow from the craftsman period that is associated with early aviation, where people thought these funny little second story units looked like an air an airplane cockpit. Well, thank you so much for joining us. There are several additional examples that we'll have online for you, and you can refer back to these. Uh, please feel free to use the charts and the graphs that were included in this presentation, and happy hunting out in your field surveys. Thank you very much. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, later today, you'll receive an email with a link to a survey. We would appreciate any feedback on this webinar and as well as recommendations for future topics. Um, I will also send the email with this link to today's presentation. And I hope you all have a good rest of the afternoon. Please feel free to email me if you have any specific questions. Thank you very much.